This is Rick Matson from the University of Washington Shoulder and Elbow Service. We're going to talk about how to do a total shoulder with respect to glenoid preparation and insertion. So the, the glenoid that we usually use is this all polyethylene glenoid that has these fluted central pegs for bone in growth. This has the advantage of a very precise geometry, preserving a lot of glenoid bone stock, and also using in-growth fixation in the central peg and additional fixation in the peripheral pegs. And when we drive this uh, component into bone, these flutes bend, as you see here, and creates good initial fixation. And then subsequently, the bone will grow into those flutes and provide additional fixation. So we, we started a long time ago wondering how to best prepare the glenoid surface so it matched the back of the glenoid component. At the time we got started, back in the 1970s, people were preparing the surface just with a curette and trying to scrape it smooth, but of course that didn't match necessarily the back of the component. Then people tried to use a pine cone burr to smooth it down, but what we found in this series of tests was that you really needed a reamer that had the same concavity as the um, back of the glenoid component so that you would get a very precise match. And you can see here we compared the stability of the scraping versus the burring versus the, spherical reaming, uh, the spherical reaming, and you can see how much stability we gain just by carefully preparing the back of the um, glenoid component uh, and the um, surface of the glenoid bone so that they match each other precisely. So we invented a spherical reamer. This initial one was uh, hand powered as you see here, but it had the advantage that we would ream along a defined central axis as shown here and that would enable us to do custom carpentry of the bone surface. Now there are um, more sophisticated reamers, such as the one shown here, that uh, are powered and can nicely ream the surface so that it is conforming. And that's what is used now to take a irregular glenoid surface as shown here and customize it to the back of a component. So we expose the glenoid um, uh, after having resected the humeral head and part of the exposure has to do with releasing the capsule around it, depending on whether there was any posterior uh, translation preoperatively or not. If there's not any posterior translation, we can be pretty vigorous with the capsule release. If there is posterior translation, then we consider doing a release stopping at about 5 o'clock. We put a flat retractor behind the humerus, against the, uh, behind the glenoid to protect the humerus, and a sharp retractor in the front along the neck of the scapula. We then carefully dissect the glenoid labrum from the periphery of the uh, glenoid to get it out of the way so that our component does not uh, rest on it uh, and have interference with complete seating. We wait to prepare the humerus until later because what we don't want to do is to crush the humerus in our attempts to get gl good glenoid exposure. So we leave the humerus unprepared while we're working on the glenoid. The first step is to curette away the uh, remaining cartilage uh, so that we are just have a nice bone surface here. And then we take a pine cone burr and remove the crest between the anterior and the posterior concavities. In our experience, almost all osteoarthritic glenoids have this biconcavity, and the goal of reaming is to get rid of the biconcavity and convert it into a, a nice single concavity. <clears throat> we also size the glenoid using sizing discs just to see about how big the patient's glenoid is so we can match that with our component. Then we're getting ready to ream the glenoid, and we mark the center point of the glenoid. We then make a little hole with a pine cone burr to stabilize the drill. Then we take the a drill and drill through that hole, 
perpendicular to the face of the glenoid, and our technique does not involve trying to change the version of the glenoid. We're just respecting the uh, natural version of the patient's glenoid because we, the reason we have come to that is our top priority is preserving glenoid bone stock. We use, again, a retractor to help shoehorn the glenoid reamer into the joint and then pull that retractor out so that we have good access of the reamer to the glenoid. We do not use a guide wire. Many systems do, but the problem with a guide wire is it dictates exactly the orientation of the glenoid reamer. Instead, we use what we call a nubbed reamer. It goes into a central pilot hole here, and we can adjust the angle of this nubbed reamer so that we're going to remove the smallest possible amount of bone. Here you can see with this guide wire, there's going to be a lot of anterior bone that's removed. Here with the nub reamer, we can angle it posteriorly and preserve a substantial amount of glenoid bone stock. When we do the reaming, we want to save these reamings because we're going to put them in the flutes that we talked about earlier in the glenoid component. We can check and make sure that we've reamed the glenoid to a single concavity as shown here. And one of the ways that we can check it is to use one of these round back glenoid trials and make sure that it doesn't tip when we press on one edge or the other edge of it. So it should fit securely uh, just without any uh, pegs or keels just on the surface so that we have a good concave convex match. Cementing we think is very important because we want to have the, the polyethylene rest directly on bone. Um, and we do not want to have interposed cement because this thin layer of cement, when it hardens, will come brittle. And that brittle cement can flake out and leave us with an unsupported glenoid component. Where we most often see this problem is when people incompletely ream the back of the glenoid and then try to fill this in with putty um, and see if they can stabilize the component there. But you can imagine this is like a pumpkin seed that's going to get uh, squoze out of here as soon as this back of the glenoid is loaded. So again, we don't want this little wedge of cement back there because it's going to take a lot of load and eventually it's going to be dislodged, leaving our component unstable. When we get ready to drill the additional fixation holes, we want to make sure that we have everything oriented on the proper axis because that's where the bone is the best. And then once we've achieved the axis orientation that we desire, then we're going to drill these peripheral holes. And each time we drill a hole, we put a peg in there to secure the uh, drill guide to the bone. And this also assures that we maintain the proper rotation of the drill guide. Once we have all the holes drilled, we're ready to cement. We like to use this sterile CO2 spray, and right before we cement each hole, we blast it with this uh, uh, CO2 gun and blow all the fluid and debris out of the hole, and then we pressurize the cement in that hole. Then we repeat the same thing in that hole and that hole, and that gives us a nice, clean um, uh, bone well in which we're going to put the cement with no fluid or anything else that may compromise the fixation. We think that's very, very important because any fluid, whether it's saline or blood or any other kind of fluid, will interfere with the secure fixation of the bone cement to the bone. So here we are pressurizing each of the holes, putting cement in there. There's no cement in the central hole because that one's going to be fixed with the fluted peg. One of the things we have to be careful of is if there's if one of the holes goes out the back or the front, for that matter, we want to avoid pressurizing it too much because there are nerves nearby. So the other thing that the CO2 um, spray gun helps us identify is leaks in the bottom of these holes. And if we identify one, then we're very careful just to fill the hole rather than pressurizing it. So here again are our glenoid reamings, which we're going to put in the peg, 
and then we drive the peg home, and now we have a secure fixation of our glenoid component. One of the other things that we've learned by hard experiences, we have to be very careful when we rotate the humerus after our glenoid component is in place to avoid the problem of having the back of the humerus catch the back of the glenoid component and lift it up. We call that bottle cap loosening, which we're very careful to avoid. So here again is our desired construct. Minimal cement. You can just barely see the cement around these peripheral pegs and a well-seated in-growth central peg. Thank you.